Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. But our feature tonight is not a person, but a thing. It's the Army Dress Green A uniform that has been used for 61 years and is going to be retired. This is the uniform that you see Colin Powell or David Petraeus in. And I'm going to read an article from the Army Times that explained what's happening to the green Class A uniform that's been used since 1954. The End of the Green Service Uniform, 1954 to 2015. The Green Service Uniform has finally been laid to rest after 61 years of approved wear, the vast majority of that stretch as the service uniform that defined the Army. As of October 1st, the Green Class A's are no longer permitted for wear. From 1902 through World War II, soldiers wore an olive and or khaki tan combination of some sort. But then the Army wanted a sharp, classic, and dignified look to distinguish soldiers in a post-war era. Enter the Army Green uniform in 1954. The dark green color, shade 44, was a throwback to the distinctive color for rifle units back in revolutionary times and was recommended to the Army by scientists and fashion experts. The jacket featured four buttons, matching pants, light gray undershirt, and black tie, in contrast with the khaki undershirt and tie in the Marine Corps' green service uniform. Green uniform experienced only minor alterations since. From Vietnam to the early years of Iraq and Afghanistan, it served as the primary dress uniform. The Army wore blue from the Revolution through the Spanish-American War. Exception due to a shortage of blue cloth, the Army issued gray uniforms as a substitute to some soldiers from 1812 to 1821. West Point cadets also adopted the gray coats in that time and still wear the color today. But in 1902, the Army introduced olive drab and khaki service uniforms. While that year's Order 81 eliminated blue, a phase-out continued in the ensuing years. Blue full-dress uniforms remained authorized until 1917. The green Class A's were born largely of the Army's desire to restore dignity and prestige to a uniform the Army saw become diluted and often sullied due to extensive wear by veterans and non-veterans alike after World War II. Nationwide, olive drab Army uniforms became a ubiquitous and inexpensive clothing item of the late 1940s. By the last year of the war, the Army had more than 8 million active duty members, nearly 6% of the United States population. Many would go home and wear out their uniforms. Many other uniforms turned up in surplus stores. In an article for a May-June 1954 issue of the Quartermaster Review, Major A.M. Camp Jr. decried the resulting debasement of the uniform, including wear by criminals and prison inmates, and its effect on the Army's reputation and morale. The soldier, being constantly confronted with the debauching of his uniform, soon loses pride in wearing it. His prestige is gradually being degraded because of the contempt shown the uniform, Camp wrote. Since 1946, this has been one of the biggest stopgaps to the adoption of a new uniform for the Army. Prestige and morale, the basis for building and maintaining a spirited, well-trained Army, have suffered as a result, in addition to the fact that the Army apparently has no exclusive rights to the wearing of the uniform. This led to the Army Green Uniform, which replaced the old ODs and became the official uniform the year after the Korean War Armistice. The service uniform went on to a long life. It was not only the uniform worn by generals to enlisted soldiers, but also a variety of famous soldier playing actors in then contemporary movies. While green dominated, Army actually had three types of service dress uniforms by the turn of the millennium. The white service uniform was introduced as a summer uniform in 1902 and remained optional until last year. And between world wars, the blue dress uniform reemerged as optional wear and remained so after introduction of the green Class A's as the primary service uniform. But in 2006, Army Chief of Staff General Peter Schoonmaker announced the Army's plans to streamline its wardrobe and make the Blues king. He notably rolled the Army service uniform out at the 2007 State of the Union Address. An all-Army's activity message in 2008 formally informed the Greens they had but six years to live. The Green Service Uniform is survived by the Class A and Class B Army Service Uniform. The Greens at this time lost favor among troops, in part because the stiff, dated polyester fabric was unchanged from the 1970s. The ASU's blue color represents a nod to the first century plus of the Army, 
From the Revolution to the Civil War and Spanish-American War, the blues became standard issue in 2010 and from there quickly became the most popular service uniform. The Army added a year to the life of the condemned Green Class A uniform in a 2011 Aller Act, pushing back the wear-out date until 2015. But the green uniforms already faded significantly in prominence, limping to the end of the road. Well, we're going to move on now to Harry Horse Gallatin, who died recently at the age of 88. He's one of the great New York Knicks of the 1950s. He was a power forward out of Roxana, Illinois, not too far from Edwardsville, not too far from St. Louis. He was a tenacious rebounder and a seven-time All-Star for the Knicks. He set their rebounding record for a single game, 33, that's only been tied by Wills Reed. And he led the league in rebounds in 1954 with 15 a game when he was All-NBA. He had a nice set shot. He wasn't especially fast or especially big. He was only 6'6", 225, which was small for a power forward even then. But he was tenacious and he never missed a game. He played in 682 regular season and 64 playoff games in a row. And that's still a New York Knick record. Here's a little snip on Harry Gelton. The first comments are by Ernie Vandeway, who was his teammate and whose podcast we did about a year ago. Next stop, Madison Square Garden. Six foot, six inch Harry Gallatin, one of the league's top rebounders. The red hot Knickerbockers get started fast as reliable Harry Gallatin dribbles in for a two-pointer. I knew Harry Gallatin from quote, quote, the very beginning. One day they said, the team is leaving, and they said, we're bringing in this farm boy. Would you stay and shoot around with him? And Mr. Lapchick asked me, tell me if he can play. That farm boy was Harry Gallatin. I was amazed at his talent. Gallatin from the side. Bullseye. New York leads out the quarter, 29-22. Gallatin was a fine player. He was real tough on the boards, a very strong player. And he had a lot of moxie. A bit of a collie. And here's a one-hander by Gallatin. Good. Bob Cousy fires to Harry Gallatin. Good. Well, I think uh, they would call me a, a hustler. Uh, somebody that, that went after every rebound, that uh, tried his best, didn't leave anything on the floor. Most of the New York fans appreciated that. Always seemed to like hardworking and, and doing what was right. You heard there his coach was Joe Lapchick, and you also heard Easy Ed McCauley mentioned as one of his opponents. Easy Ed McCauley introduced Harry Gelden at his induction into the Hall of Fame in 1991. Well, the induction of Harry Gallatin, Hall of Famer, Easy Ed McCall. Those of us who played in the 50s against Harry Gallatin knew one thing when we played against him. When we come, we had better be ready. Because Harry Gallatin played every minute of every game. And if you weren't ready, you lost. People look back to the 50s, great ball players, and they ask me and they ask, ask other people of our era, well, how would you have done if you played today? I don't think you can make that comparison. The only way you can make those comparisons is to judge a man or a woman how they did against their peers. Napoleon was a great general. Eisenhower and MacArthur were great generals in their time. This man belongs. He achieved great heights. Harry Gallant from the horse. In his speech, Harry Gallant talks about moving back to southern Illinois with his wife near his hometown to Edwardsville where he coached and taught at the Edwardsville campus of Southern Illinois University. Finally decided that Bev and I had had enough of travel. It was time for us to settle down. Moved back seven miles from home to SIU Edwardsville. Dad and I used to hunt squirrels and quail, not too far from home. I've been there for 24 years. It's a great university, and all my friends in Edwardsville, believe me, this is a great moment for me. A lot of the reporters asked me, what's it mean to you? be elected to the Hall of Fame. It's the ultimate reward, a labor of love for me. It's like going to heaven, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It's everything because it's a game that I truly love and always will. We're going to move on now to Kevin Corcoran, who died recently at the age of 66. He was one of the Disney child stars of the 50s. He's best known for playing Tommy Kirk's brother in a bunch of these late 50s, early 60s Disney movies like Old Yeller, The Shaggy Dog, and Swiss Family Robinson. And he was also known as Moochie in the Disney television series Spin and Marty. And he had his own Moochie spin-off for a little while. Here's Celeb TV on the death of Kevin Corcoran. Disney legend Kevin Corcoran has died at the age of 66. The famed child star was best known for playing Moochie in the Spin and Marty serials on the Mickey Mouse Club 
and went on to work in movies including Pollyanna, Swiss Family Robinson, and Old Yeller. Kevin quit acting when he was a teenager but later returned to TV, but this time behind the scenes as a director and producer of shows like The Shield and Sons of Anarchy. Well, I mentioned Moochie had his own shows there for a little while. Walt Disney was trying to portray the all-American Southern California image in the late 50s and early 60s. So on his Sunday night Disney television show, he had Moochie playing Pop Warner football. Walt Disney presents, from Fantasyland, Moochie of Pop Warner football. Hi, Mom. Hi, Pop. Hi, Mr. Preston. Hi, Moochie. Oh, gee. Would you mind explaining? What are you doing? I was laying out. Uh, Mochi. Yes, sir? I don't mean to pry into your affairs, but would you mind telling me why is it necessary to weigh your lunch? Because i got to gain 10 pounds in a hurry. Why? Because I want to become a midget. You want to become a midget? Yes, sir. They don't have peewees around here. Peewees? Mochi, would you mind? Oh, what are you talking about? Football. Pop Warner football. Pop Warner football? Uh-huh. The Pop Warner midgets playing over in the park. It's just like Little League Baseball, except the coach said I was too little to play. And of course, Moochie also played in Little League, but here he has to deliver papers, so he enlists his girlfriend on her bicycle to help him deliver so he can get to the big game. Hi, Mooch. Hi, baby. Need any help today? I sure could use some. What time is it now? Must be at least half past. Golly! I bet I won't make the game today. I'll help you. Thanks, Stevie. Yeah, that's mid-20th century Americana. We're going to close tonight with Billy Joe Royal, who died recently at the age of 73. He's a southern rock and roller. He grew up in Valdosta, Georgia. He was influenced by everyone from Elvis Presley to Sam Cooke. His main influence were guys like Ray Stevens and Joe South. And in 1965, Joe South, whose podcast we've done, wrote him a song that went top 10 and became Billy Joe Royal's trademark. Pretty decent follow-ups. This risque one about a naughty girl in the park. Mary Hill used to hang out in Cherry Hill Park. The game she played lasted all day to way after dark. All the girls, they criticized her. But all the guys just idolized her. Cause Mary Hill was such a kind of Next to Down in the Boondocks, this is the one he's most famous for, another Joe South tune. Hush, that's the original. Of course, you might know it by Deep Purple. I do have to admit that version is pretty good. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. I'm going to close with one of Billy Joe Royal's other songs. It's actually my favorite and my rock and roll buddy Bill's favorite, too. It's not as well known, but I thought it was a great song, I Knew You When. Yeah.